Where else would you rather be? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to the People of Penn State podcast. Each week on the podcast, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State network. The People of Penn State podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. Go ahead and subscribe and give us a rating. Ratings and reviews are the best way to help other Penn Staters find these stories. I'm excited today that we have Captain Tom Ulmer joining us. Tom is from the class of 96. He is a commissioned naval officer with 27 years of experience. A surface warfare officer, he has commanded two Navy warships and led a diverse workforce through routine operations to crisis while circumnavigating the globe and conducting operations worldwide. Through his service, he has participated in operations that responded to natural disasters, providing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, evacuated thousands from war zones and conducted operations in support of our national security. Joining the Navy in its infancy of exploring the integration of cyber technology into systems and operations, he has been a leader in generating revolutionary naval warfighting concepts for the future, the underpinning them with the enabling the technology to transform the Navy. He continues to spearhead innovative warfighting capabilities as the executive director for distributed fleet synthetic training, integrating the Navy strike groups with joint services and allies across the globe to deliver quality, realistic, synthetic, high-end warfare training. Please welcome Captain Tom Ulmer to the podcast. Tom, how are you? Excellent, Paul. Great to see you again. It's a mouthful, all the, <laughs> all the great things that you are uh, involved in. Before we get to all of that, let's start off right at the very beginning. How did you become a Penn State Nittany Lion? Well, so it's interesting because as you go through the podcast, a lot of people have talked about, hey, you know, I've always wanted to be there. There were a couple of recently said, hey, you know, I really wasn't thinking about being a Penn State. So, uh, I'm from upstate Pennsylvania and uh, a lot of my friends went to Penn State. So it was one of those. Do I really want to go to the same place that all my friends went? And I kind of looked I looked at a whole bunch of different schools all over, mostly the northeast, but on the eastern seaboard. And I'd been like I said, been to Penn State a number of times and I was looking to go aerospace engineering and is one day we. My parents forced me to go on campus and instantly fell in love. I don't know what suddenly tripped that one time from all the other times that I'd been there. But all of a sudden I was like, this is where I want to go. Forget everything else. This is where I want to go. And uh, never regretted it. Absolutely loved it. Tom, when you were here at Penn State, what are some of the things that you were involved in as a student? Well, the number one thing I was involved in was the Navy ROTC. And that consumed a lot of my time uh, as a freshman year. You're doing drill three nights a week out there in Shields parking lot, which is now right across from the, the ice arena and you marching around, you know, an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, like I said, three days a week. So that took up a lot of time, study halls and things like that. I also participated in, in club soccer. Love that uh, intramural soccer, did a lot of intramurals, lived there in West Halls and uh, participated with the dorm and all kinds of different fun things uh, involved in uh, Officer Christian Fellowship and another orga other organizations like that. So it seems like you had kind of Navy on the mind when you came to Penn State. So what did you study? And if, if something beyond the Navy was an original career goal, what was that? So the original plan was I wanted an aerospace engineering degree. And then the goal was to become a Navy pilot, eventually a Navy astronaut, because uh, that was my goal. Um, about midway through, uh, I decided that that was not exactly where I was going to go. And... Uh, switched over to administration of justice. And to be honest, I pulled out the big blue catalog book and started reading each of the different majors, and all the courses. And I was like, wow, that one really interests me. So yeah, after two years of being an engineer, and it wasn't that I didn't love the engineering. I just, it just, the passion wasn't there anymore. I still wanted to be a pilot, still wanted to do that astronaut thing, but uh, uh, the passion for aerospace just was not there like I wanted it to be. So yeah, went over into, into administration of justice and absolutely loved it. Um, I love the courses I took there uh, in the criminology area, uh, went on to get a master's eventually in criminology, which is an interesting thing because, um, I have a degree from Florida state signed by Eric Barron. 
Um, and I have other things here from Penn State that are also signed by him. So I have that that well, link between my masters and and Penn State where the you know those two are. But uh, some of the other, I, I'll be honest, the the one course that really sticks out in my college career is Theater 100 with Helen Manful. Um, that was just an amazing course. I'm not a uh, I'm not really good in the theater. My family is Becky, my wife. Uh, she does that. Uh, my daughter Elizabeth was just in a performance of Willy Wonka. But uh, I, that course was just, it was a fun class to just be participating in. I learned so much out of it. But anyways. Yeah, shout out to Elizabeth for her uh, for her performance. Absolutely. She did wonderful. She played Charlie one night and did a phenomenal job. That's awesome. This is the People of Penn State podcast. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by Captain Tom Omer, he is the Director of Operations and Exercise Director for the Tactical Training Group Pacific. So, Tom, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your family. You mentioned Elizabeth, uh, but your family has some deep roots and some fun family names that you're able to come up with having the last name that begins with the U. So let's talk about your family's connection to Penn State. Sure. My, uh, my grandfather, uh, who was also in the Navy, was uh, a Penn Stater. So my dad was actually born in State College. Then uh, they, that whole side of the family went to the other Penn, which everybody gets confused by. I don't know how many times, oh, you went to Penn. I'm like, no, I went to Penn State. Uh, I just want to make sure we understood that, uh, the better of the two schools. The, uh, then, uh, so I went, my brother and uh, his wife, Marion. So my brother, Dave, his wife, Marion, and I went, Becky went to Penn State, uh, although we went at separate times, my wife, Becky. Uh, my nephew, Will, is attending there now. So if you go to any of the, the sporting events, the odds are Will is there running the scoreboards. Yep. Um, my cousins, John and Michael, also went there. So the Ulmer side of it has, has got a lot of tradition going to Penn State. The, uh, yeah, so the fun of having a, a last name that starts with a U is that you can, uh, you can uh, get initials PSU for a couple of your children if your spouse allows you to do so, since mine is a Penn State grad. I won on that one. Uh, so uh, Elizabeth is named after her. Uh, our oldest Elizabeth is named after her grandmother. Uh, but Phoebe, uh, Phoebe Cheryl Ulmer, so PSU. And then uh, we have Patrick Shepard Ulmer. So we have two PSUs. We have a dog, Nittany. Um, yeah, we're, we're those people. <laughs> we explain that to people like, oh, you're those Penn Staters. We're like, yes, we are. Yeah. And uh, I think when you get out of my daughter, <laughs> I think when you say those Penn Staters, too, uh, you mentioned your brother, Dave. Uh, shout out to Dave Ulmer. Uh, but your your brother was uh, part of the start of what has become an iconic tradition Absolutely. here at Penn State. Tell our listeners what Dave was involved in. So Dave was, uh, when he was with uh, the Lion Ambassadors, he uh, uh, they came together on the S-Zone. So if you remember back to the S-Zone's roots, it, uh, it there was the, the S-Zone guy. Um, he dressed up like a superhero. He had a mask. He had a cape. Uh, his wife, Marion, made those things for him. And, yeah, he just – he led the, the S zone in cheering and, and getting that whole thing together. So, yeah, it's, he's, he's really been involved with the university as well through Alumni Council. Uh, he taught for a while there, um, just really connected with the university. And, uh, it's, and he – I'll be honest, uh, he did a lot of things to draw me back into the Alumni Association and, and getting involved again. So shout out to Dave. So, Tom, you were able to, while you were here at Penn State, have some unique experiences in terms of um, summer jobs, right? Uh, you got to work at, at Disney. Tell us about being part of the Disney program and that experience. Absolutely. So it was kind of neat because I didn't know that Disney hires college program, uh, college students to come work at the throughout the uh, three main semesters of the year. And I was walking through the hub. A friend of mine was supposed to come study with me. She didn't show up. So I ended up walking through the hub and there was a picture of of Mickey and I stopped and looked and said they were having an info session down in Henderson. So I stopped down and uh, eventually got an interview and, and ended up working as a lifeguard at Typhoon Lagoon in Disney World uh, summer of my sophomore year. Oh, sorry, summer after freshman year, summer after sophomore year. And then I ended up with an internship my senior year uh, with Disney's uh, security management team, which so my office was on Main Street USA right above the, the Kodak shop and the confectionery which is right. really, it's got great location, except for whenever I went into my boss's office, uh, he was directly above the confectionery. And what they do is they take the, the smell of the cotton candy that they're making, they pump it out into the street. 
there are a couple leaks in the ventilation. So his <laughs> office smells like cotton candy all the time. So, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was a great opportunity. I got to uh, work the first Disney Indy uh, car race. I worked on the infield for that. There's a, there's a bloopers video out there that shows uh, at the end of the race that the leader was supposed to go around the track three times and then stop. And my team was going to come off and we didn't have a winner circle yet. So we were going to come out and rope off the area. So the media couldn't get there. And uh, is where I told everybody, here goes one, two, three, we all ran out. I'm standing there leading everybody. And all of a sudden the winner decided to take a fourth victory lap and you could hear him spin up around turn three and gun it down the straightaway. So I would yell at everybody to go diving off the, off the track back into the, uh, uh, the pit area. And then we had to come back out and restage ourselves again. But wow, um, <laughs> I got to work the quarterback challenge, which was cool because I uh, ran into Kerry Collins and I got to do some personal security for Kerry there um, during that. And Kerry and I had had a connection back at school. There was a huge snowball fight between East halls and center. And I was out there throwing snowballs right out being a West guy. I had no you know skin in this game, right. but uh Carrie's out there throwing snowballs and his, you know, if you know, he's also a pitcher and that dude can wail a snowball. So I'm like, uh, do I want to be on Carrie's side? Or do I want to be on the receiving side. So uh, I made snowballs for him and gave them to him. And he had remembered that when I ran into him at the quarterback challenge, That's but, awesome. Uh, got to do some fun stuff there with Disney. That is awesome. Now, uh, anyone who's listening thus far into the podcast, they can tell that you have tremendous pride for Penn state, but on occasion, that pride has gotten you into trouble. Talk about almost being arrested in Tiananmen Square. Yes. So uh, I was stationed in Japan uh, back in 2003 to 2005 and took a, a trip over to, to China and uh, had a wonderful time there. But I was taking a tour of the Forbidden City and Tiananmen Square, and we ended up going out to some other places. And as I'm standing there, as I always do, I always carried a, a Penn State three by five flag. And I was wearing a Penn state hat. I had a Penn state polo shirt on and I pull out my Penn state flag in the middle of Tiananmen square and ask somebody to take a picture of me and get junked. Um, my tour guide tackles me, police come running. And uh, she's like, you can't do, you can't protest. I'm like, I just want a picture with my university flag. She's like, I'm pointing and trying to tell her all this Penn state stuff, language barrier and a whole bunch of things. Police didn't like it too well, but I was able to continue on my tour, um, but I did get one picture of me holding the flag up before I got jumped. Uh, that's that is fantastic. So, Tom, let's talk about your Navy career, right? Your really? your fourth generation um, yep. Navy in your family. Uh, I, I you and I are about the same age, right? So I would imagine the movie Top Gun probably had at least some influence beyond the family connection. To Navy. So talk about why you decided to join the Navy and serve our country. So I'll be honest, from the time I was about four years old, I knew I wanted to. Top Gun was a huge influence. And yeah, just like you were the same age. Um, if you talk to anybody in the Navy, that was probably the number one recruiting. It was the number one recruiting Navy. Uh, sorry, number one Navy recruiting movie ever. Um, the second one is phenomenal as well. But uh, I wanted to fly and I wanted to fly because of that movie. Um the uh, so fourth generation, my great great grandfather was in my my two grandfathers were in during World War II. Uh, my dad was in during Vietnam, and then uh, and most of us all were on ships. So I was the breaking off, and I wanted to go fly. That didn't work out for me, but um, I've enjoyed the 27 years driving ships, and and it's been a lot of fun. And I don't, and uh, it all started there at Penn State. Yeah, it, it's funny, you know, throughout your throughout your career. Um, visited 38 countries on official business, um, yep. many, many more as a, as a tourist. Uh, but you just, you said something that kind of sparked, uh, you know, made me chuckle a little bit. Your official title or you're professionally known as a surface warfare officer. Uh, yes. But really that just means you get to drive the ship, right? Exactly. That means that, yes, I'm on the water. I'm not underneath the, the submariners or the guys underneath and, there's something about that. I'd, I'd like at least having the option that if something bad happens, I can still at least swim away. So uh, yeah, surface warfare. I drive ships, um, everything from little, uh, your little uh, small motor boats. I've driven aircraft carriers physically. You know, when I was in Penn State, got to go out there while they were doing launch and recovery of aircraft. And I was driving an aircraft carrier. A lot of fun. 
Um, but nowadays, I instead of physically getting to drive them, I get to give the directions and tell people how to do that. Yeah. One of the fascinating things about your your service in our military um, has been, you know, some of the things that I don't that I think don't readily come to mind when we think of um, of the Navy or of military. Right. I think of the Navy and I think of people like you putting yourself between danger and me. Right. And yet yeah. a lot of the a lot of the missions that you served on um, were part of we were talking about this off uh, off camera you know, part of being a global force for good, uh, humanitarian missions, yep. missions where you're out um, helping people or extracting people from dangerous situations. Talk about some of those missions that maybe uh, we don't readily think about when we think United States Navy. Sure. Actually, we do a lot more of those than uh, we really do anything in the combat operations area. Uh, the Navy has really has been where it matters, when it matters, and, the, and the, uh, so I'll, I'll kind of use my experience with humanitarian assistance. It's both outside of the United States and we also do um, support of, of civil service here in, in the United States. Uh, when I was stationed in Japan, which I previously mentioned, there were two typhoons that hit the Philippines back to back weeks. So we got underway. Uh, I was on an amphibious ship, which is really what that means is that we carry Marines. We also have a lot of cargo space and we also carry helicopters and a bunch of other equipment that the Marines can bring so that we can help restore areas. We can build um, temporary houses for people. We can uh, provide electricity. We provide food. Um, so in that Indonesia, sorry, in that Philippines area, that's what we were doing. We were, it was on the East Coast and we, we were mostly bringing in food and clothing to them. During the tsunami in 2004, 2005, we went, uh, my ship went specifically off of Indonesia on the south side of, of Banda Aceh. And from our ship alone, we provided 1.2 million pounds of humanitarian assistance across the beach in a little, about a month, which by the way, so there was, they talk a lot about the aircraft carrier, the Lincoln that was there and the entire Lincoln strike group didn't put that much across in one ship. Um, our cycle, it was kind of, it was every night about one o'clock in the morning, I'd receive an email from the shore saying, we need this food. We need these clothings. We need this equipment at this location go. So that was, that would start the planning cycle. And then we would connect with a ship that was off the coast, um, that had pallets of food and all the other equipment and the clothing and, and a lot of things, a lot of, what's interesting is a lot of people donate food, clothing, household goods, and things like that, and are provided to us to be able to, to just help people. Because during the tsunami, I mean, the one town that we were near, uh, one out of 10 people survived the, the tsunami. Um, so, you know, they're totally devastated, reliant on anything that can, that can come. And all the, there are just countries from all over the world participating in this. But that we're, we are really suited in the amphibious force to be able to help this. We can get in close. We can put the helicopters and carry rice and other things like that ashore. We have landing craft that can drive up, I think, World War II D-Day, put a ramp down on the beach, um, and, and we can drive vehicles off for delivering more food. We'd go off the coast, have helicopters bring 400 more pallets to distribute over the next few days. And when this cycle just kept going on every single day. And it's just it's neat to be able to see the 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 – um, relief on people's faces when they see people are there to help them. We worked with the, uh, the world, um, food organization, sorry, world food, yeah. um, USAID and other organizations like that. So we helped out in Indonesia fast forward eight months. And I found myself, um, following Katrina into the Gulf. Uh, we went to, we went down to Mississippi's where we started out and ended up in new Orleans and, we had about 15 ships in that area. We had everything from minesweepers that were going through and checking the stability of all the oil rigs. They have a sonar system where they were checking for cracks and, and checking the stability of those. Uh, they were also checking the, the waterways because, you know, coming out of the Mississippi and all the stuff that flew out of the Mississippi, uh, floated down the Mississippi, making sure that was clear, uh, working with the Coast Guard and other organizations to clear that out. But you know, we went into the Ninth Ward and were providing food and we had helicopters that were, that were providing rescue services. So a lot of different, we bring, you know, when a disaster happens globally, 
Uh, one of the first questions it asks is, hey, where are the amphibs? Where are the Navy ships? Because we have a unique access. We don't need airports. We don't need anything else. We float in and we can bring uh, we can bring aid. And uh, so those three happened all within about uh, within a year. And then about a year later, I found myself off of Lebanon uh, as we helped to evacuate 15,000 Americans out of there because there was a war going on. So the what things everyone likes to think of the bright, shiny, pointy nose ships that shoot missiles or the aircraft carriers that fly uh, jets. Um, but there's a lot of things that we do that that just help people on, in their daily lives. Uh, and it's it's been a lot of fun to just see the see. Yes, that that look that, hey, somebody's here to help me. We're not here on our own um, and somebody else cares. So, Tom, we were talking about Top Gun a little bit earlier and, you know, the, the call names of Goose and Maverick and, and Iceman. Right. Um, but listening to you talk, your call sign actually sounds like it's really on brand for you. Terry and Tom, that's my uh, that's my call sign, because uh, is the Navy lessons learned people. They follow around because they want to figure out how we can do this better next time. And on the first one that, on the Philippines, the guy's like, oh, he, he introduced himself as a Navy captain. And then he it ran into me in Indonesia, kind of turned his head a little bit. And then he ran into me in New Orleans. And then then people started picking up on this. And then so when I started showing up to, to commands after that, people were a little bit concerned because when they saw my resume, because they were thinking that, oh, well, disasters follow this guy wherever he goes. But no, humanitarian, Tom, it's uh, it's really been a pleasure to, to do that and to, to work with all the sailors and Marines that, that really put in the. You know, they're the sailors and Marines that I mostly I work with, you know, 90, 95 percent of them are college age um, who are Americans who are just uh, they're trying. They join the Navy for who knows what reason. Uh, actually, it's kind of neat when I sit down and talk to each of them when they come on board the ship or at my new command and they say, hey, so why did you join the Navy? And uh, hey, some of it's for education. Some of it's to get out of their area. Some of it's I've done this for so long. Uh, I, you know, my family's been doing this for years or, hey, I just wanted to grow up or things like that. Uh, one of the interesting people that I met early on in my career, you know, I had the name Sears and uh, I was like, eh, okay, Sears. Uh, I talked, started talking with him a little bit and he had been in the Navy for about four years and was getting ready to get out. And I said, Hey, so what, tell me, why did you join? He goes, well, my parents, yep, go figure it out. My name's Sears. Yes, I am one of those. And my parents wanted me to grow up before I could get any interest in the, in the business. I had to go prove that I could actually be an adult. Uh, show responsibility. So I joined the Navy and then now he's off to incorporate. So yeah, it doesn't, you never know. You, you know, the sailors who come in amazing, uh, the sailors and Marines are amazingly connected. And um, some you, you're like, you joined um, and you're, you're very low on the, on the pay grade, but you've got a doctorate. Why, why did you join? Why didn't you start as an officer? Well, cause I wanted to start here. This is what I wanted to do. And you're like, it, they're amazing. Uh, come from all over the country, all over the world. Uh, it's just been a privilege to serve with them. So, Tom, you've had the opportunity to command two ships. What was that like? It's like being the mayor of a small town with a mobile airport. Uh, the first ship I had was a little over 600 feet long. We had 365 sailors and Marines. And then we brought an additional 450 uh, Marines on board when we deployed. Uh, we could carry, uh, I'd carried six helicopters on there before. The second ship I was on is a, a, a mini aircraft carrier. It's a Marine aircraft carrier. So we don't have the catapult systems like they do on the major uh, aircraft carriers, but we had vertical launch uh, jets. Uh, the F-35 Lightning is the, is the jet that we carried. And we had uh, 10 other uh, major aircraft on there. And then we had five other helicopters, but we had a, a crew of 2,500. Sorry, we had a crew of, uh, 1,100, and then we had another 2,500 that could come on board. My hometown of Wellsboro is 4,000 people. So this was about the same. And you have all the same problems. So like I said, it's kind of like being a mayor. I had to provide electricity. I had to provide water. I had to provide food, recreation, you know, sleeping arrangements. So all the hospitality that goes into that. And you've got to manage all those people trying to, everybody's got their own way they think everything should be run. So yeah, you've got all of those problems. Oh, plumbing. Can't forget about that one because that's always an important one. Um, you have a jail. Wow. <laughs> you have all kinds of stuff. It's literally like being the mayor and having to take all those inputs. And then, yep. Yeah. And then as you're moving, try to get that aircraft carrier going. 
So Tom, you're currently serving with the Tactical Training Group Pacific. Uh, talk about your responsibilities in, in your role there. Sure. So it's the I'm essentially the director of training. Uh, I We run classroom training uh, year-wide. Uh, our primary course is to train strike group staffs uh, to, for deployment. So we do a whole bunch of in-house classes that, that support that, how to teach them how to plan, how to use the equipment they have, how to lead in their warfare area. So if it's, you know, how to, how to plan a mission strike, how to plan submarine operations, how to plan surface operations in those kind of areas. And then we also take, uh, ships will come through and they'll spend uh, time training to be an individual ship. Our next step is to take them and bring all those individual ships, all the staffs, all the aircraft, all of that stuff together and train them to work as one organization. How do they communicate? How do they, okay, if we're going to do this operation, who all is involved in it, get them all to talk on the same page. And then we throw in high-end warfare training on top of that, which means they're going against a competitor who is equal to them. How do you beat them? So we'll, all of our, we, it's either classroom training or we do synthetic training. Um, it's, it's the synthetic training is kind of cool because uh, you're actually sitting on your ship using your equipment and we're connecting you to other ships, aircraft, like the aircraft are sitting in their simulators. Um, but we also connect not just Navy entities, we connect Air Force and Army and Marines and Space Corps and other countries. So re in a recent exercise, I was able to connect ships and aircraft in Australia to aircraft in Halifax to Air Force bombers in South Dakota, to SEALs and special warfare operators in Alaska, to ships in, in Yakuza, Japan, Hawaii, and San Diego. So essentially half of the world was covered synthetically just connecting all of them. And then when we're done with them, when they get past us, they go out and do it all live. Um, and we can also, all that simulation that we do, we can also connect to them while they're underway um, so the ship thinks that and it looks to them as if they're fighting uh, that synthetically, but they feel like they're fighting against that pure competitor. So your next mission with the Navy uh, keeps you uh, in the education space because that's predominantly what you're doing now is uh, training and education. But yes. it's a little bit of a, a, a different twist on it. It's going to put you in the center of the country, thousands of miles from an ocean. Tell us about your next mission. Absolutely. So uh, we're moving to uh, the University of Missouri, Mizzou. Uh, I'm going to be the professor of naval science, which means that uh, I'll be the head of the, the Navy's ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, there at Mizzou, and uh, training midshipmen to become officers when they graduate. Uh, it's, uh, it's the program that I went through at Penn State, but it's there at Mizzou. Yeah, it's a little bit strange because, yeah, there's no water around. It'll be the furthest I've been from water in 27 years. And, uh, but we're really excited about that. It's, uh, um, as I said, you know, I've been working with college age kids for years uh, um, and I've learned so much from them. So it's, it's as much as, you know, me training them as much as they are training me, but it's, a, it's it gives me an opportunity to take the experience that I have. Um, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the things that I've learned, the heritage and things that I've learned through the Navy and be able to, to give back to um, the next generation as they're coming through and, and uh, they're going headed out to to serve um and protect us i'm looking forward to what innovative classroom techniques you come up with i can't wait to see humanitarian tom on tiktok absolutely <laughs> <laughs> tom, no, in, addition, in addition to our service to your service to our country you've also found ways to give back to penn state you served on alumni council as you mentioned you're on the society of distinguished alumni why is giving back to your alma mater important to you? I learned a lot about life from Penn State. Um, and I know that everybody who, whatever school you go to, you learn a lot about it. And of course that becomes part of your family, but, but Penn State is my family. Um, it's no matter where you go in the world, you get this, we are, and it, it connects us all. And so as a person, I have, I have been overwhelmed by the amount of love and, uh, and friendship from so many 
that it, it just that's that's how I give back is by through mentoring and and being involved with the university um, because it is my family and uh, it, it's it's just a part that's ingrained in me and and I love it and I love the university and I love the people that the alumni and the students that are there and it's just it's just a great part of life. This is the People of Penn State podcast. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by Captain Tom Almer. He's the Director for Operations and Exercise, Director for the Tactical Training Group Pacific. So, Tom, we like to have a little bit of fun here at the end of our podcast with what we call the lightning round. I'm going to throw a bunch of quick hitter questions at you, and, and you just say the first thing that comes to mind. I think okay. you've already given this one away, but your favorite class at Penn State Theater 100 with Helen Manful. How about your your favorite or most memorable mission in the Navy? Memorable mission would have been Indonesia uh, and the humanitarian assistance there. Memory is the thousands of sailors and Marines that, that I would get to work with. So I normally ask people if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? But knowing that you're a tailgate guy, if you could invite two famous people to tailgate with you, who would who would those wow. people be? Oh, and maybe a little bit about the menu, maybe because I know it would be a customized menu to the guests you've invited. Absolutely. So, um, as you know, because you were at my tailgate for the uh, for the Rose Bowl. Being, uh, by the way, I really appreciated the the football team accommodating me and coming here to, to Southern California so that I could pull out my tailgate gear and and uh, go to that. Um, wow. So yeah, the food depends on on the on the game and and that. Whew. Um, this is the hardest question I've asked you. I know. <laughs> uh, I would say Kyle Brady. Okay. And um, John Amici. All right, all right. Two Penn State Penn State legends, and and what would you be serving? Maybe some. Some bangers and mash because John's from uh, from London. Uh, I would I definitely would bring something to be able to tie that in. It depends on what time of the day because you know because you know when we do the twelve o'clock games, I like to have more breakfast style. But we get later in the afternoon, and we had tacos in, in Southern Cal. But uh, you know, if it gets later in the afternoon, I'm I'm all about cooking the steak at, at the tailgate. Uh, oh yeah. And, the, yeah, the street tacos at the Rose Bowl were were fantastic i'm still i'm still craving that <laughs> salsa that you put on them so it was uh it was phenomenal yeah that was yeah though but uh, yeah i would definitely have to throw in something for john like that so yeah, the, the connection i have there with john is that when john was going through um i of course lived in west halls and I played basketball up at rec hall and he would just come out and shoot hoops so he oh, and wow. i would i'd play one-on-one -on -one with him every once in a while so yeah me all five nine of me playing against all <laughs> six and 11 of him. Yeah. That my inside game didn't exist, but I could shoot threes. That's amazing. So and I ran into Kyle down at church in Florida one time. Oh, wow. Okay. So your most unusual, we are moment, you get the chance to travel the world, right? Where, where were you, where you heard we are and didn't expect it, or you shouted it to somebody else. So it was recently, um, my wife and I were in Sydney and we were going to a, we we're meeting up with a bunch of uh, Australian Navy personnel at the Opera House. And it's just one of those, you hear it and you're like, did I actually just hear that? And I turn around and this guy's smiling at me, goes, yep, we are. And I said, Penn State. Um, so yeah, it just kind of threw me off. Uh, but uh, it, you get it, like I said, you get it everywhere. But that was the one I think that, that stands out recently. Absolutely. How about your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? Oh, uh, bittersweet mint. Although alumni swirl is there. <laughs> Scorn. Alumni, I'm going to go alumni swirl. All right. There we go. And your favorite Penn State sport? Football. A popular <laughs> Although, answer here on the podcast. It is. I know. Uh, wrestling. Uh, I really right. enjoy that one. Uh, I spent, you know, when I was in school, Spent a lot of time watching basketball games uh, back with Coach Park Hill uh, and, the, yeah. and the team there. Um, some good memories of that as well. But I got to go out to uh, spend a lot of time going out to all the different types of sports. I love soccer. Go out there and watch the women's and the men's teams. 
Um, yeah, just I had, when I had the opportunity to go to a sporting event, I was out there. Well, Tom, our alma mater says, may our lives swell thy fame. And certainly through your service to our country and your service back to your alma mater, your life has swelled thy fame of dear old state. And we are truly grateful for that. Thanks for joining us on the People of Penn State podcast. Thanks for having me, Paul. I want to thank our producer, Vincent Longaro, for all the great work that he does. Abby Clark for scheduling and all that she does to work with our guests uh, each episode. If you like this episode, I hope that you'll subscribe to the People of Penn State podcast in your favorite podcast app of choice. And again, while you're there, go ahead and drop us a review and a rating. Help us spread the word to fellow Penn Staters about the great stories that we're telling here on the People of Penn State. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. And if you're not a member, what are you waiting for? Go to our website at alumni.psu.edu, and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thanks for tuning in and for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are...